Eagle Song, Chapter 5, The Longest Day Although June 21st was supposed to be the longest day of the year, Danny knew that wasn't so. Friday, any Friday when there was school, was really the longest day. Friday always crept by so slowly. It taunted you because you knew that when it was over, it would be the weekend. This Friday already seemed as if it was going to be even longer than most. Not only was there going to be an afternoon test, it was also the day after his father came to class. Danny had hoped that things would be better today, but so far, things had been worse. It had started with the phone call last night. The phone had been ringing when the two of them got home from Danny's school. Richard Bigtree had another building project to go to, a microwave tower near Philadelphia. Usually there'd be some downtime between jobs, but this one was a hurry-up deal. The tower was half done and some of the crew that had been working on it had quit. They'd be working over the weekend, but the pay would be even better than usual. Danny's father had to go because he was the chief of his connecting crew. The connectors were the ones who worked on the very top of the structure being built. So, early that Friday morning, even before Danny woke up, his father left. He'd go straight from Philadelphia to the Pittsburgh job. He wouldn't be back for two whole weeks. Danny stayed in bed, not wanting to get up. His mother was in such a bad mood that Danny knew he couldn't talk to her. She banged the dishes in the kitchen sink while she was washing them, and then she dropped something. Danny heard it fall to the floor and shatter. Then everything became quiet. Danny began to worry about his mother. He padded into the kitchen in his slippers to help her pick up the pieces. But she was just sitting on the floor and crying. Danny put his arm around her and patted her on the back the way her father always did with him. But it didn't work. It just made her cry harder. Mom, Danny finally said, trying to make his voice deep and certain like his father's. You gotta go to work. I know, his mom said. Thank you, Daniel. That worried Danny even more. His mother only called him Daniel when she was upset with him or when she was really, really sad. But she got up off the floor. As his mother got his things together, Danny came up and stood beside her. Mom, I'm going to walk you to the station. You don't have time. You'll be late to school, his mother said. You could give me a note, Danny suggested. His mom thought about that. Okay, she said. Danny stayed close to his mother's side all the way to her subway station, and she hugged him hard before going down the steps. He waited until she was out of sight, then turned and walked the other way to his station. Danny had never been late for school before, and he wasn't quite sure what to do when he arrived and saw the familiar front yard of the school completely empty of kids. It was so quiet. He walked through the front door and nodded to Mr. Kincaid, the uniform security guard. Mr. Kincaid was cool. He was almost seven feet tall and had been a basketball player, he was from Jamaica and spoke with an accent that Danny really liked. A lot of the kids liked Mr. Kincaid's way of saying things. You could sometimes hear them imitating the way he said things, especially man. Mr. Kincaid said it as if there were several extra letters in the word. Man, Mr. Kincaid said, looking down at Danny and shaking his head. You lose your wristwatch? Danny shook his head and Mr. Kincaid smiled. Through the doorway. Mr. Kincaid took Danny's lunchbox and looked in it as Danny walked through one of the four metal detectors. Two years after a fifth grader had brought his father's loaded thirty-eight into the school. Now, going through the metal detectors was a part of the routine of every school day. You are clean, man, Mr. Kincaid said, handing Danny back his lunchbox. Danny paused, uncertain what to do. Mr. Kincaid bent down. What's the matter, he said. Don't you know what to do when you're late like this? Danny shook his head. Do you have a note from your mother? Danny nodded. Mr. Kincaid stood up straight and smiled. No problem, man, he said. Show the note to the office, then go to your room. Mrs. Carter, the administrative secretary in the office, 
took Danny's note without even looking up from her desk. She glanced at it, nodded, and jotted something down on a sheet. Then she reached out to press a button on the console in front of her and spoke into the microphone. Miss Mowbray, she said, Daniel Bigtree excused Hardy on his way to class now. Mrs. Carter looked up at Danny. Remember the way? she said. Danny nodded, but he didn't move. He felt like everything around him was moving in slow motion. It was almost like a dream where your feet are covered with glue and you can't move, make them run or walk. Then go to your classroom. Danny turned and moved his feet, unsticking from the floor one step at a time. The hall was long, and except for the sound of his feet quiet, he remembered a movie he had seen on TV. In one scene, somebody was walking down a long corridor with many doors in it. The person walked and walked, and then all of a sudden, a monster jumped out and grabbed him. Danny pictured that monster looking a little like a cross between Tyrone and Ador Dahon in his father's story. The monster would be even taller than Mr. Kincaid, and it would roar at him as it jumped out of the doorway. But Danny made it to the door of his classroom without a monster getting him. He reached out his hand for the doorknob and paused. Had his father's visit made a difference? Or would things be just the way they were before? When he opened the door, it made one of the loudest sounds Danny had ever heard. Everyone looked at him as he closed the door behind himself and stood there. Someone laughed. Take your seat, Daniel, Miss Mowbray said. Then she started reading again. Danny liked this book, but today he hardly heard it. He was looking at the clock again, hoping it would magically lead, leap up ahead, and it would be time for recess, but the clock still moved slowly. One breath in, and one breath out. Is at least a second, Danny thought. If I breathe in and out sixty times, it'll be a minute. Tick by tick and breath by breath, the morning crept past. One minute, five minutes, ten minutes. It was endless. Then, somehow, it was time for them to go outside. Danny walked out into the schoolyard, trying to act casual. People usually didn't notice him. Why should today be any different? But Consuela was waving at him. He looked around. Maybe there was someone behind him she was waving to? Nope, there was nobody else. She was smiling, and she motioned for him to come over to a place where she stood with a group of other kids by the swings. Danny began to walk across the end of the basketball court to reach the swing set. Yo, Hiawatha! Someone yelled. Danny turned to look. It was Tyrone standing 20 feet from him. Here, Tyrone shouted. He threw the basketball he had been holding straight at Danny. Danny tried to get his hands up in time. He couldn't. The basketball came flying at him, getting bigger and bigger until it was all he could see. It hit him square in the face. There was a blinding light and a sharp pain all at once. Danny went down onto one knee and put a hand up to his face over his mouth and nose. One of the fifth grade teachers, a man whose name Danny wasn't sure of, was coming over to him. Mr. Rosario, Mr. Mario. His nose was aching now and his mother felt warm and moist. He had to remember the name of the teacher. As the teacher helped him up, Danny saw Tyrone. He hadn't moved. His mouth was open and he was staring at Danny. Brad grabbed Tyrone's arm and pulled at him. The two boys turned and ran away. What happened? The teacher said. Mr. Rosario, that was his name. I... Danny tried to talk, but his mouth was full of blood. His nose was bleeding too, and it was dripping onto the pavement of the schoolyard. Madre de Dios, Mr. Rosario said. He quickly pulled out some Kleenex tissues and pressed them against Danny's nose. I slipped and hit my face on the ground, Danny said. He saw Consuela out of the corner of his eyes. She had heard what had he said. Just hold these tissues tight, Mr. Rosario said. I'll get you into the nurse. By the time Danny reached the nurse's office, a strange thing had begun to happen. The day, which had crept along like a snail, had started to go faster and faster. Somehow he sat there and the nurse took care of him. It became lunchtime. Someone had brought his lunch. You'd better eat, said the nurse. That was some gusher you had, kiddo. Your nose isn't broken, but you lost a lot of blood. 
you might feel a little lightheaded, so you gotta get some food in you, laddie. Danny ate. The cut on his lip didn't hurt much when he ate. His nose still felt like it was twice as big as his face, though. When he was done, he looked up at the clock. Another hour had gone by. He had he started to stand up when the nurse came back in and then sat down again, feeling dizzy. Whoa there, she said. You look like you need to take it easy. Let's get you to this cot. Danny let the nurse lead him to the bed. I called your mother, the nurse said, as Danny put his head down on the pillow. Just so there will be someone to make sure you get home, okay? She's leaving work early to pick you up. Danny closed his eyes. It didn't seem as if he slept, but when he opened his eyes again, his mother was sitting next to the cot holding her purse. Are you okay? His mother's voice, calm but concerned, made him feel better. I'm fine. Maybe I ought to go back to class. On Monday, his mother said. She looked up at the clock. Danny looked up the clock, too. School had been out for half an hour. It was past time to go home. Somehow, this longest day had become one of the shortest ones.